Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Between Two Fans with your two fans, DVP and Mr. Dan Skoltz. And uh, we are into July. Uh, it is uh, the, the yes, time is yes, ticking. Sir. And uh, do you know what that means, Dan? It means we are into like crunch time with so many different sports. The international tournaments ramping up in the football world. We are firmly into international season. I think the first of July does actually signify whenever that sort of rule fits to whatever it is that World Rugby allows players to be playing for their nations where the clubs cannot hold them back. And we are also into Olympic month as well as arguably the biggest tennis event of the year in Wimbledon. Um, which, uh, you know, in between the busyness of working, Mr. Dan Scott appears to be uh, a spot, popping up at a few sporty events. So we'll talk a little <laughs> bit about that as well. Dan, how are you? Um, I'm phenomenal, Stevie. Um, turns out work doesn't care about um, busy sporting events and, you know, the Wimbledon being on at the same time as, um, you know, the County Cricket Championship and Euros. Um, so we're having to we're having to work a, a double hours um, for both, right. um, and we are not complaining at all. Um, yeah, I managed to get myself a little Wimbledon ticket yesterday. You know, watching Coco Golf from row row one of Centre Court. Um, no, I did not purchase that ticket, but that's yeah, where I was about I to say. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the facilities for that quite yet. Um, maybe ever, but no, phenomenal. Um, but bring on the, the summer sport but you're right it's the it's the kind of out of all the end of the new it's the big transition time within all the different sporting faculties yeah 100 percent. and um yeah i think it's gonna, it's gonna be funny one of those things where, where july i think it's gonna be ridiculously hectic and then suddenly we go into august where everything sort of quiet and downs a little bit after that we'll have a bit of an olympic hangover but then the premier league gets going so a little bit of football coming back uh but dan before we get into any sport let's go through the predictions do you want to take us through that Stevie, I, I, I really, really do. You know, I really do. Um, <laughs> so for those new around here, um, Stevie and I predict on three um, sporting matches of the weekend, um, the, the biggest ones at least from, from through our lens, and then, um, you know, the, the winner of which gets a point at the end of each week, and we are on the race to 15, and the score was 11 points to 10 um, in my favor going into this week. We made three different predictions. We predicted on Afghanistan Proteus because they had not played their semi-final um, in the Cricket World Cup T20, as well as India versus England. Um, and then we also um, predicted on Switzerland versus Italy. First of all, Stevie, um, Afghanistan versus the Proteus. Um, my prediction was Proteus by either eight runs or four wickets. And Stevie, yours was either by 12 runs or five wickets. So um, none of us very close. And despite us being up at all hours of the morning, I don't think either of us predicted a 56 all out for Afghanistan. No, um, no, it was, it was a little mental. <laughs> South Africa going on to win that game by nine wickets with 67 balls remaining, having bowled out Afghanistan for 56 runs in 11 um, 0.5 overs. Um, so a real sweep there. It was quite remarkable. Up early and managed to get back to bed for a couple more hours of rest before work began. Um, so Stevie, you you do take the lead there um, with your um, extra extra wicket um, choice. And then we move on to India versus England. My prediction was 18 runs or four wickets. Stevie, yours was 15 runs or three wickets. Um, and I just edged you out. Another blowout win. Two blowout semi-final wins. India going on to win that one by 68 runs. India posting 171 for seven after their allotted 20 overs. And England replying with 103 all out in 16.4 overs. So a pretty poor attempt at chasing that one down. Um, so that settles that. That's 1-1 one, one. going into the final game. Switzerland versus Italy, um, which we both predicted the correct winner. Um, the result was 2-0. Steve, your prediction was 1-1 one, one and Switzerland to win on penalties. Mine was 2-1. So as a result of mine being a win straight off the bat, I am going to take the dub for that. And by You are really that, like chief of Mr. Technicalities, eh? I mean, it's not like the technicalities were invented this week, eh? Yeah, well, to be yeah. fair, we, we we did have to put a rule, for example, when we looked at the draws and stuff like that. But I, you know what I, I want from you, Dan? I want you to predict something on the money and not you just be like two, two more two more runs for me in like a 68-1 win. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Listen, Stevie, it's not about show about being right. It's just about being less wrong. Yeah, literally. <laughs> I know. No, put it this way. None of us are giving our betting advice. Like, we are so no. far off the mark every single time. <laughs> but if you're a betting sponsor, um, get in touch. <laughs> yeah, correct, correct. Maybe you can help us, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, so Stevie, that takes it to 12.10. Race to 15 is firmly on. I was thinking maybe there's a Euro shirt that you wouldn't want to wear that I could maybe make you wear, but that Arsenal one seems to be very, very lovely. Um, for those who I don't know what you're speaking about, whoever gets to 15 first gets to nominate a shirt of the others choosing um, for them to wear for a couple episodes. Should they have you in like an England rugby shirt, dude? Don't stress. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, yeah, you see, this is, I'm starting to think Ireland rugby shirt maybe yeah. by the end of the series it might be a, a whole different type of island we're speaking about i mean you can have and an all that's... black shirt and have your like passport burn on re-entry <laughs> that is true um stevie good transition let's get into the rugby this weekend and it is the big test match we've all been waiting for south africa versus ireland at loftus yeah, listen, it's it doesn't get any bigger than this. Um, and I've been in the various camps over the last few weeks. And I'll tell you what, uh, very interesting how calm and relaxed both camps are. Yesterday I was um, up the road, um, talking to the Irish guys, uh, Paul O'Connell, the forwards coach, uh, gave a press conference, as did Colvin Nash. Um, and very, very relaxed. Um, Paul O'Connell, actually, I mean, it's a very cool um, press conference to come up on the channel this morning. Uh, he was asked about the Rusty Erasmus media antics, and he said, he actually had a good joke. He said, well, in all fairness, if we had won the World Cup, um, people probably would also be asking us to come on podcast, but nobody wants to speak to us. <laughs> so, um, which I thought was, uh, was, was, was not wrong, but, uh, you know, it was good of him to acknowledge that, that basically he's like, well, these guys are going to have to do a lot of media because they've won a World Cup. And he said that credit to Rusty, he said, the, the life of a head coach is so hectic. He says, you've got to try and find a way to make it fun. And he does do the media and he's, he enjoys it and he's really good at it. So it was quite funny how he sort of played all because we all get so, and world rugby, the, the world sort of, of media gets so obsessed with the Rusty Rasmus media stuff. And so many fans hate it. And you've got the Irish guy going, ah, he's good at it, whatever. It's fun. So um, yeah. interesting that they played it off there. Rusty Rasmus, if you haven't watched that press conference yesterday, could not have been in a better mood. Um, did you have you have you heard the joke about the sharks that you yes. made? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So, no, taking up sharks men, taking up their positions, and they all went underneath the poles, having conceded or lost eight games on the trot. Yeah, so, it's unbelievable it, answer from him. And the only person you could probably say that while sitting next to um, Evan Smith. Yeah, exactly. Uh, even made a bit of a chirp about how much money Eben makes. So it's it's been a very interesting environment because it has been so relaxed. Um, we are obviously quite early in the week. We'll be interested to th see how things sort of go. I've got Andy Farrell on tomorrow and um, evening, which is going to be fun. And obviously, Sia Khaleesi is on d Stick show on Friday. So look, the, 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 it's definitely ramp. You have if you are like, if you're a world champion and haven't lost in a while, right? Like yeah. imagine Warren Gatlin. Now going up to a press conference off the back of eight losses with and Wales. Talking about how bad the flipping like the <laughs> the dragons were this season, dude. <laughs> yeah. He probably would, to be fair, but he would do it in such a different way. He'd be like, "Look what I'm dealing with. I've got this shit team that can't yeah. win like more than two URC games, and now you're expecting me like to to beat Australia away? Like, come on, Alex." Yeah, his isn't sarcasm, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I think it's 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 going to be it's going to be. I mean, look, I mean, yesterday Super Sport dropped, dropped a whole hype video that the Springboks in collaboration with the Springboks about the whole new rivalry. Um, it's been interesting. Um, I'm very That's interested the, to see the zombie tour, hey Stevie. Yeah, the zombie tour, which which I want to chat a bit about because there's a couple of articles where the Irish um, fans have warned in inverted commas um, South Africans not to sing the Rassi song. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting scenario because it's a bit like the, the singing, um, swing low sweet chariot in the England stadium and people sort of say that it's not very appropriate to sing these days. So, uh, a lot of the Irish fans are quite upset by the taking of, um, the, the song zombie, which they sing and, and turning into Russie. The reason being that, um, there are quite a lot of sort of cultural associations with, uh, the, uh, the zombie and and the relevance about that and and yeah there was it's a, an interesting it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a protest song against um a bombing that happened i believe from the irish armed forces um yeah. in the conflict between north and um northern ireland and the republic of ireland and there were two people that died in these two bombings children two, two children, children died in these, yeah these bombings and 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 the song is um 
kind of an ode to that and i mean ireland rugby in of itself is i think the only irish sport where northern ireland and republic of ireland actually play together yeah. which is why they sing um the national anthem is like ireland together standing tall because it's a testament to both countries kind of coming together um and yeah as you mentioned the kind of the sweet low um or swing low sweet chariot is is also got come kind of some different historical um kind of you know background mm -hmm. the reality is i just don't think i think it's gone past that stage unfortunately and and the only the only way i see it not happening because i know the fans will sing it i heard it in twickenham um last weekend the song, i suppose it's on me itself the the, the the rassy song yeah um i saw it just, i heard it just being sung by the crowd yeah. um with no prompt whatsoever so that's going to happen with no prompt whatsoever, whether they play it over the big speaker yeah. and maybe some powers that be, you know, kind of relay a message to be like, listen, we're not going to play it. Um, I imagine it is going to get played though. It absolutely is. Yeah. I don't think, um, the, especially the Loftus DJ has come under a bit of fire lately. I don't think he's got quite the, uh, um, the, I don't think he's clued up enough to understand uh, the the potential implications <laughs> of it to uh, to to not play it. Um, it'll be one of those things that'll definitely get played. It's an interesting situation, isn't it? Look, to be fair, there has been criticism even for the fact that the Irish fans sing it and that they, it has become a bit of a rugby anthem, which sometimes some people are saying sort of trivializes the meaning of the song. Um, my controversial opinion is I don't particularly like the Rassi song because I've just heard it so many effing times. <laughs> <laughs> going around France and like every single bar to this to that coming back and every single bar and it gets sung so it's just been sung you to say death. That, but then you've had yeah. two kinds and then all of a sudden it's impossible not to sing well we'll see this weekend I think um yeah. if, if I do go out and, and hammer us um maybe maybe we might not be yeah, singing I, it for, I think, for much listen, longer the, 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 the winner earns the right to sing the song right um, <laughs> I, I i think i think the song is going to be sung regardless like you can um you know you're certainly not stopping the south africans from singing it put yeah, it that way yeah you, you absolutely aren't and and i think there's maybe an acknowledgement of like its significance but you know everyone's saying well like this is being sung you know, for, it's been sent for a long time and, or, or it's more that it's just picked on and it's become bigger than, than the song itself. Um, yeah. and it's just, it's almost like, it's like, and this is how we defend Rusty, you know, yeah. this, the, the, the Messiah himself. Um, and this literally, you know, every single Springbok fan in Loftus does view Rusty as exactly that. So, um, it's going to be hard to, to, um, persuade him otherwise, but, Stevie, let's quickly get into the lineups and um, or what's been announced for the weekend. We don't mm. have the Ireland team. We do have well, we, we, we do Rasmus the Ireland team. team. Yeah, I was about to say we've got we've got the, the Ireland team that Rusty Rasmus is expecting. And to be fair, everyone's talking about oh, like he's the genius. He's predicted the Ireland team. If you do believe that, then you have been watching Ireland because a five-year-old could predict that Ireland team. One thing about Andy Farrell is that he does not adjust to other teams. He's got his twenty-three and. You know, we basically can pick it. Um, he also, yeah. I mean, he also he, did this with England at the at the semi final of the World Cup. Yeah. He also predicted their team. It's, it's not un, unlike him. Prefer, the, yeah. England, the England prediction was more fun because then they were still sort of playing around with what's going to happen, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas no, the Irish team, England, you know, yeah. it's not, I mean, Andy Farrell's not going to suddenly put Dan Sheehan on the bench this weekend and be like, oh, that's a big one. And like, <laughs> he's not going to suddenly bring Josh van der Fleer off the bench and be like, oh, that's yeah. like a bomb squad. Like, we know what the Ireland team is going to be this weekend. The and only call in verdict commons is going to be Craig Casey or Conor Murray to start, but I, I think it's inevitable Craig Casey will start because he has the only, he's, the, he's the closest to a Jamison Gibson Park alternative. I also um, think it's quite funny because I think it's also, it's a bit of a spite at all other coaches just to show them how um, much, you know, flexibility he has and how he never picks the same team twice already. Um, we did see some consistency, and this team is probably the most consistent one we saw. Yeah, I was about to say, because at the same time, we've also picked the second most experienced team ever. Yeah. So it's not like there are a lot of, I mean, there's not a lot of new faces this weekend. There are some, but... Um, even, but... even that, even the fact that we picked the most experienced team, there are still surprises in there. Um, I, think, I mean, surprises on the bench. I, th I think the only surprise in the starting lineup is, um, was going to be Bongi or Malcolm to start, and he was going to be at eight. Yeah. Well, yeah, let, let's get into it, Stevie. We've got um, Fox, Bongi, and France um, on that front row. As you said, Bongi um, 
select you to start over Malcolm, um, which was the inverse during Wales. Then we've got Eben and Franco Mostat in the 4-5 combination. Um, we've got six Captain Sia Khaleesi, as we predicted um, a couple of weeks ago. So we are um, unbelievably glad to, to have him back and just can't wait to hear the reception that he gets just back in South Africa. It's going to be huge. Um, and then at seven, Peter Steph to toy. Eight is the big one in Quacha Smith retiring from the bomb squad and now into the starting lineup. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many minutes he gets through. Nine, ten is the classic Faf Hundred Pollard combination. And then the back line is is as normal as it gets. Curtly Arenser coming back mir- miraculously quickly from that cheekbone inj- um, injury. Then he's paired up with Chesden Colby um, at 14 on the other wing with Willie LaRue at the back um, coming in, having um, just off the back of that URC final. And then the centre pairing, which is going to equal um, the record of Jean de Villiers and Jacques Ferry and Jesse Krill and Damien Dialindi in 13 and 12. I'm not he's sure I'm ready for, by the way, I'm just on that. I'm not sure I'm ready for there to be a centre pairing with more caps than Ferry and de Villiers. Like... I, it's That's quite wild. emotional for me. It is. And also, <laughs> that was my childhood. And, you know, even if Lucanio and... Um, even if Lucanio was picked with... Um, Damien. With Damien Dill and D, they would then have... Then they would have equaled gone ahead. Mm. So, they, so, Je- so the fact, I mean, that, just, the fact that, that, that Jacques and, and Jacques could be down to third within a yeah, matter of like true. three or four <laughs> tests is, is also... Yeah, it's, wow. it's a pretty emotional one for me. They, those are my boys. Yeah, no. That, that, that's just like peak... 2009 book yeah. supremacy um Jacques Ferry is just what what a guy what a player yeah um, the largest chest in rugby yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the best try I've ever seen scored for for any Springbok um Stevie let's jump straight into that number eight um discussion and the big one is that Evan Roos has been left out to his mm. um the natural eight that everyone saw replacing, um, you know, obviously the the retiring Dwayne from Mullen and um, Jasper Visa, who is on a, um, you know, on a suspension right now because of a tip tackle. Um, so he's not going to be playing at all this series. Evan Rose is the natural eight. Obviously, Kwaka has played a lot. They played there a couple of weekends ago. Um, but that is the biggest surprise, I'd say. Yeah, I think it is, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we we have to have a breakdown threat. We've got to slow down that Irish rack speed. Um, and I think there's two things. I think slowing down the Irish rack speed um, from a a breakdown point of view, when you don't have Malcolm Mark starting, you need uh, that fetcher. Um, you know, you've also got no Stephen Kitts off. I think that's made a big difference. Um, so you don't have him as the extra fetcher because you all know that mm. swiping a prop is one of the best fetchers in that in that team. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the breakdowns is going to be incredibly important. It's been mentioned in the various press conferences, for example. It's why you've got a Mark of starting on the bench as well. Um, instead of going for, for somebody like a Ben yeah. Jason Dixon, for example, who's maybe a bit more versatile, um, or going with an Evan Rose as a natural age replacement. So, yeah, I also think that, you know, Evan Rose has had, I think he had a decent game against Wales, but I think... He had a very non Springbok eighth man game in terms of um, that. You know, they always talk about their battle stats and and that being more than just running fifty meters with the ball and and breaking line breaks. You know, a number eight for the for, for the box always characteristically carried very strong into contact. Um, been very reliable under the high ball, for example. Um, usually and 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 hitting a lot, hitting a lot of racks and wearing down opposition. And Evan Rose is a very different type of eight from that. He, you know, he loves to be in, in around the fringes, for example, loves to get himself um, into a bit of space. And mm-hmm. and I think that, you know, it's it'll be the rucks, the the and, and also I think the major, massive thing for Quack Smith is his defense, his scramble defense. This yeah. island team, it's gonna be such a nerve wracking watch, and we've seen it before because they are gonna break our line several times this weekend. That's yeah. going to happen. You know, the, the, the attacking shape, the way they play the game, they will be breaking online several times. And having that sort of scramble defense is going to be massive. And that's where somebody like Quacka Smith comes to his own. He's got so much pace around the park. Um, it is interesting not having a genuine replacement for him. Uh, he's the only one there who, you know, is a genuine eight option. You know, see, he's played once there this season for racing. Yeah, you could um, probably but, slot in Mark up and start in yeah. if you wanted to. Um but yeah, as you said, not 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 a genuine eight, but I mean we have seen this is what and, and what's interesting is even Evan Ruiz actually started playing a bit of seven yeah. this year. 
And so, and we've seen Ulrich Lowe, for example, play seven and eight. We've seen Pepsi play eight and six. Evan Rose actually plays at, at six as well. So mm-hmm. we've seen all these guys sort of starting to play in different positions because we all know that, especially in the Spring Market side, versatility is what gets you through. There's, an, there's yeah. a certain Sasha Fahmi Gomazulu in that number 23 jersey who is there. I want to say simply there, but he is there because he is a, a, a utility player. If, if it was just a case of wanting a, a fly up on the bench, it would have been Monty Leibach. No, exactly, and let's get into Sasha because he has he has jumped the the gun and and become that extra. You know, it's always there's always the um, scrum off, and then there's one extra who is the who's who is going to be that extra person. Mm-hmm. It has been you know money before. Sometimes it's been Vili um, when um, usually it was actually I think it was Vili at the World Cup. Um, when, but only if Damien Williams is starting. Only a bit. Damien Villains was yeah. starting. With, so I was going to say, obviously, him, Damien being injured now, Villy slotted naturally to that 15 position. Um, and there is that extra space on the bench. Sasha being able to cover 10, 12, and I guess 15 and any of the wings. So um, it's literally just 9 and 13 that he, and he probably could play 13, I guess. Um, probably 9. <laughs> probably play 9 as well. Um, and the big one is also goal kicking responsibilities. If Andre does go down um, yeah. or, 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 or if he gets, if he's the one to get subbed, he can take those on and he, we know how good of a goal kicker he is. So, you know, I think having both of those in your, to, to be so versatile, but also then to have that X factor thing on top of that to say, oh yeah, but I'm also like an 80% goal kicker. You know, that, 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 that gives a lot of yeah. good reason for, for someone like Rassi to give, to put his faith in you. So, um, props to him. He had only about 15 minutes in that Wales game to make make a point, and he he made that point enough to be able to earn um, the start, uh, 20 you know match day 23 versus Ireland, which I think very very few would have predicted. Yeah, no, I think I think it's 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 it's, it's so cool to see. I mean, we obviously know that this guy this, that this kid is special, um, and you know you listen to an interview for example, and you can't not like him. Um, but I think it's 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 interesting how many people have freaked out by the lack of youth and experimentation that we're doing which also by the way blows my mind this whole thing of yo but we bring, we're basically to the 2019 team we've got all this death we're only going to see it there's so many players not getting capped am i the only one that wants to like win this weekend and like <laughs> win beat ireland twice and everybody's like yo but this is the team that like has been since 2019 i was like oh so the team has won two world cups and the british and irish Lions series they can't be that shit yeah if that's the, we, the, the history did, you know yeah we spoke about this at the, I think at the end of the last World Cup in that it's interesting to see who makes the next World Cup cycle and is, is that's why like there was even the like there are a lot of question marks about you know a lot of these players and are they going to make it you know you just like Eben, Frank Osea and Peter Steff and France you know and Bongi for example that's 2-7 two, two, they all may or may not make it to yeah. the next World Cup but they all could and they're all world class players. So yeah. if they are fit, they will be picked. But we just don't know whether they'll be fit because they'll be at an age where they're probably getting more injuries and and yeah. maybe maybe form starts tipping as well. But you know, all, all things considered, they will stay well. But one thing that Rusty has said is that you know the difference between I think previously is you know he's always gone and said it's all about World Cups. And he said that recently I'd way rather win, you know, two World Cups in a British Irish Lions series than, you know, and then lose three other games. But which I've actually yeah. got a video coming out on my personal channel, which is a bit of a gripe I've got moving forward. Because I think that but, that's something we need to change. But that's, but he, but they have alluded to that as well in mm. wanting to improve, I think, form between tournaments as well and to win a couple of rugby championships. You know, there's nothing I want more now than just a bloody rugby championship because I feel yeah. like we're only win it when it's like some shortened version of it mm-hmm. and then you're celebrating in Argentina. Yeah. And I think we you know we talk about the great all black side, you know, that sort of 2011, 2017, and they just, they collected every bloody rugby championship going and all the Bledisloe Cups and the two World Cups and, 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 and I think that, you know, everyone's they're saying, yeah, but, you know, we win the World Cup, which is what matters. And my attitude is, but we're good enough to do both. You know, we're good enough to be competitive in between World Cups while still contending and winning potential World Cups. So I do think we're going to see more sort of integration. Um, but why must we press reset for the biggest match against Ireland, arguably ever, you know, in terms of being a proper genuine grudge match at Ireland's side that we haven't beaten for many years? Um, you know, why 
throw the baby out with the bathwater. I yeah. mean, you've still got like, oh, players you like you just Steph. <laughs> exactly. And you're just going to say to Pollard, well, you know, you're actually done because, you know, we need to see the new uh, uh, fire halves and you're going yeah. to go and throw France by Herbert away. I mean, you've still got players who very easy make, make, make the next World Cup in at Oxen Share, a Kirtley Orange, uh, um, a Jesse Creel, uh, off yeah. the bench, and Malcolm Marks, Kiros Dina Kamp, Salman Murat, Arkes Tavim. You know, Grant Williams, that's why I'm going to do. There's still a good 10 players who definitely make the next World Cup, which is almost half a team. Which is why we also have a 39 man squad. Which is actually a 46 man squad. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know when, when they're going to Durban, for example, Sia Masuku and Tukokunu, they will come and train with yeah. the box because they're based in Durban. Yeah, so, so they're, 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 you know, we, we've seen signs, particularly from, you know, the Wales team of, of kind of who the next gen is. I'd say the biggest worries are probably in the middle of the park, actually in 12, 13, because we haven't had anyone else. We mentioned, you know, Dylan D, Jesse and Lucanio. Lucanio's still got um, time and he's got years, but, you know, and the others are, don't look like they're slowing down at all, but I think if they were, if they were to be yeah, too well, big... Good, good, luck, good luck telling JC Crew the way he looks that he's old. Yeah. No, I mean... At 30 years old, you know. I mean, he, for, he, he, I mean for me, he'll be around the next World Cup. Uh, this, yeah. And I think you'll we'll end up with 100 caps. Yeah, well, sure. I think also what people also mistake is just because the guy's been around doesn't mean he's necessarily old. You know, somebody like a Malcolm Marks easily makes the next World Cup. Andre Pollard makes the next World Cup. Jesse Kill makes the next World Cup. Just because they they've got... They debut in 21. Exactly. You know, I mean, we forget how young some of these guys were when they started. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I mean, that's like saying, for example, we take Sasha Fahman and Gomez to the next World Cup and then, you know, at 29 Listen, years man. old, you'd be like, okay, well, you need to be moved on because we've got to go find a 21-year-old now. And you think yeah. about... Dwayne Fumun and the rugby he was playing last year, what, 37, 38 years old? Yeah. Dion yeah. Free and the performance he put in. I'm sorry, Johnny Sexton last year. You know, there are players who are rewriting, you know, what it's, what, what, what the, I mean, Sam Whitelock and Brody mm -hmm. Metallic playing last year at, I don't think, one of the oldest combinations ever and still one of the most dominant. Well, so I, I know, I think you get far too assessed with age. You know, I think this whole sort of bidding players at 30 is wild for me. <laughs> Let's jump into then the the big one in that we've obviously chatted about um, you know Sasha, but now also Gerard Steenkamp. He's been he's been brought in. Um, this is I feel like his first you know this is a test. Mass test. Yeah, real real. I think came with the bench against Argentina in Argentina. You know, in in a game which he kind of was more like an obligation game. <laughs> like yeah. we have to go over there and play it. So that I think that that's very exciting. I'm excited. Also, obviously, a big island island pack as well. They mm. they are dominant. They are physical. So he'll be um, joined by Vincent Koch on the bench. Um, the other the main man who we've spoken about previously, who seems to get a get a nod in without without many questions or or man of the match performances, Salman Murat. Yeah, <laughs> that that, that the bench. Salman Murat. You know, it's it's a case of in Rasi we trust at this stage yep. because we have no reason to have we haven't seen any form to show that he's like uh, you know as good as as anyone else but um we know he's he's absolutely massive he's a good jumper he's capable um but we know the talent we just haven't seen it really materialize in because inconsistency yeah and, and unlike others he gets to you know earn himself that spot whilst wearing green and gold um mm. but it'll be interesting to see obviously two locks in him and Arches Neymar coming off the bench um that means Franco Mostad will probably um shift to um the flank in place of probably Sia um, um, and then and then Sia coming off or um, Mark Van Staden potentially um, starting in for Peter Steff as well. Um, Stevie, also he did allude to be fair that this might change and another classic Rusty move that they've been a couple niggles so this might change to a 7-1. Um, there's rumors that Cheslin might still not be 100%. Um, what do you think the possibilities of those are? Well, it's an interesting one, especially talking about the fact that Cheslin might not be fit because Cheslin was the one that kind of enabled that 7-1 split because he was going to be starting to number nine if we were to go that – when we went that route for in, in the final. So mm -hmm. the weird thing for me is that if it's Cheslin that's the doubt and we then go to 7-1, that would then mean starting Grant Williams on the wing. Now, would you start Grant Williams on the wing ahead of an Edville van yeah. for example? No. no. I personally wouldn't. No. Um, you know, for me, it would make more sense if they said, you know, Vili's a bit of a risk – um, um, but even then, you know, like, what are you going to do? So start mm -hmm. Sasha and have just Ace come off on the bench? Yeah, so I don't – it's a weird one for me to sort of allude that there could be a 7-1 a 
possibility because I think you're chasing somebody that unlocks that idea of a seven one unless they unless they are genuinely thinking about Grant Williams, um, or else they go with or else you starting like a Sasha and just having AH come off on the bench. So it's a bit of a weird one for me. I, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm a bit confused as to how that might work. Anyways, let, let, let's speculate no longer, but really looking forward to that. Um, and let's, let's jump right into the football, Stevie. The Euros round of 16 is complete. Um, let's quickly get through just some of the results there. As mentioned previously, Switzerland winning 2-0, knocking out um, defending champions. Italy, Germany, the hosts, beating Denmark 2-0 as well. England, just scraping by. Um, in a 2-1 win, that was an extra time with Jude Bellingham equalising in the 95th minute with one minute remaining. Um, Spain going out and beating Georgia 4-1 after going 1-0 down. A very dominant display by them. Um, France just edging out Belgium in a 1-0 win um, with an own goal from Batongan in the 85th minute. And then Portugal going on to beat Slovenia um, on penalties after a 0-0 full-time um, result. Then it was Netherlands who showed a very dominant display last night versus Romania winning 3-0. Cody Gakpo is looking absolutely immense for them. And then it was Austria the um, who got out of that death group on top somehow and now have unfortunately lost to Turkey, or unfortunately for them, lost to Turkey 2-1. So it sets up some very, very interesting quarterfinal clashes, Stevie. And I love the quarterfinals. It is my favorite part of any footballing competition because it's always unbelievable teams who, you know, have... It can't be a mistake at this point. It can't be fluke that you get into a quarterfinal. Maybe you can yeah, win. Yeah, and yet there's always that final. one team that's gone a bit on a bit of a run that you kind of like... Yeah. Didn't back them to yeah. get the quarterfinals. I mean, you look at you look at those quarterfinals and you look at Turkey and you're going, "How would not have called Tur- Turkey in that?" <laughs> There's always that one. You know, it's 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 been it's been like Sweden before, for example. You know, we were speaking about it earlier. Um, you know, some, even like Croatia lost, when they went to that run. Euros. Um, so there's always that one. There's always that one team that sort of has that one wild round of sixteen game. Finally, like winds out in the quarterfinals. But this is where the boys become men, isn't it? Exactly. Um, Exactly, and I think and, you know. I think I wonder if we put the markets on it because we talked about how much we love the Euros, and for me, it's been a very unmemorable Euro so far. Um, you know, the Portugal game was probably the biggest like drama in terms of being held nil nil. Um, you know, and having to and and the, and the England game as well. Um, obviously, having to come back against Slovakia and stuff like that. But we've yet to see sort of those those those, those seismic clashes. That we're hopefully, yeah. we're going to see on Friday in a Spain versus Germany. Are we going to see you know like that three two thriller? Yeah, you know, two of the best teams in the competition. Yeah, and when there have been thrillers, it's been like it's like you know the biggest one is as you said was probably the Portugal and England one, and they beat Slovakia and Slovenia. Exactly. You know I mean? it's, it's been not... thrillers where like a team where they should never have ever been like question, they they rock up, they play dreadful football, but in the end they both threw. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there wasn't a sh- there wasn't like a shock exit, you know. It feels like the story of this Euro is even like a French team that's like now through and they're also unbeaten, but they've been horrible. They've scored about yeah. Three goals in four games. They've they've been very very average. But then you can just you're almost just waiting for the sleeping giant to kick into gear, and yeah. then be like, oh yeah, there's that French team. You know that's that's what they were capable of. So I was and and what's quite nice I think is that because of that there aren't any foregone conclusions. You know, mm. might not have been the most um, enthralling of of all matches at this point, but you're looking at now possibly the two favourites in Spain and Germany coming up against each other in this quarterfinal um, clash. Uh, just because of form, they've been the two teams who've been able to score um, goals pretty pretty freely. So I think for me, that's the, that's the pick of the quarterfinals um, and we'll, we'll be predicting on that one later. Um, the other ones are Portugal versus France, obviously two Which matches. Which should be a good game, but they've both yeah, been terrible. When you look at the lineup, yeah, you, no, you look on, at the paper, lineup, on paper, it's unreal. Football, well, but this they've both been be dreadful insane. so far this tournament. So we can see a 0-0 coming there. Yeah, <laughs> um, great. And then England, Switzerland. England also not playing to their abilities. I, I was sure they were getting knocked out. I was actually watching it from the Oval Cricket Ground underneath one of the stands. And it was quite funny watching everyone run in between 
um, the cricket and the football. And the footy, yeah. Um, I saw the Jude goal, went to go watch the cricket and missed the Harry Kane goal. Um, so, um, unfortunate. But, so England are, are, you know, going up against the Switzerland where, you know, you've just got Granit Xhaka, um, who is at the peak of his powers when wearing that red shirt, right? He is just ridiculously good. And, and I really, really like the Switzerland team. I think they could go, um, I think they have every chance of beating England um in the quarters and every chance of you know even going on and and winning a semi-final so i'm really really excited to watch that game unfold um see if england can also finally um feel like they can switch on and then the final one is going to be netherlands versus turkey um turkey as you said those probably the the outliers um of all of these teams particularly after austria had such a good um such a good group stage um so it'll be great to see how how they get on um how they get on there but i want to first get your thoughts on this ronaldo experience that we are all um yeah. watching unfold before our eyes you know him being almost completely central to everything they are trying to do yet it just doesn't feel like he's capable of doing them do you think that is the case do you think he's unlucky how do you think portugal should be playing this yeah, look, the biggest problem, and, and he's done it so many times, is that everybody sort of saying on Monday that he was the problem and that, you know, if, if they had just, you know, been bringing him off the bench as an impact player, that, you know, Portugal would be so much better and, you know, they would have probably been through really and they would have had the, the issue and stuff like that. Um, and I think, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, truth in that, especially when you watch the way they played on Monday. But to be that person to say, well, he's the problem in the team at your own peril because he's the type of person that will rock up on Friday and score a hat-trick against France and sit there and say, cool, well, now what? So it is an interesting one because you kind of think, like, it, oh, this must be the end. When else did he do that for Portugal? Well, when I mean, because he, he hasn't he hasn't scored um, in this Euros yet. He's played, every, well, not every single minute, but he's started every single game even the game versus the, the lesser teams when they were already getting through. He hasn't, he missed the penalty, obviously, um, versus Slovenia. He, he scored one in the, in the shootout, um, finally. But are they giving him, you know, we saw what happened in the, in the World Cup when they dropped him and they gave it to, gave the position to Ramos. He went out to actually score a hat-trick that game. Um, so is he just demanding that he starts, do you think? Or... Is it just the case that he's undroppable? Are they waiting for that? Do they? Because for me, when I see it, he's been, he's had enough opportunities to score, and and it's, he seems to be getting in the right areas. Um, he's been caught offside a couple of times, which probably just shows you that he's slowed down a little bit and can't can't doesn't have the pace he once did. But the Ronaldo we knew used to score goals like those with the opportunities he had, and he's not anymore. And it, for me, it just feels like it's a team that's waiting to be unleashed but can't be because of the size of um, his stature and name. Yeah, but it's been an interesting tournament, hasn't it? it? In that it hasn't been a tournament where you're sort of expected, you know, your superstars have scored plenty of goals. I mean, it's been a very strange goal and boot race. Yeah, you know, Harry Kane most, has, most goals has, has, three. has got, what, like two? Mbappe has yeah. been, you know, you know, so you've got all these players you sort of expect to be... Um, you know, at the, leading this race, and it's it's not quite been been the case like that. So it has been a very strange years with regards to that. Um, so it's an interesting situation, isn't it? Because you know, you you it's it's I mean, you, you know, you know, you're dropping your best player of all time, for example. Um, and you know, when you talk about does Roberto Martinez have the the the, the courage to do that, for example? Does he, um, you know, and, and and what everybody's saying is that he should be the um, that he's the problem and stuff like that. But again, you know, we, we're talking about, you know, he hasn't scored a goal yet. The golden boot at the moment is tied with three goals. <laughs> so, you know, he scores two on a Friday, for example, and he becomes like one of the second or third highest goal scorers in the tournament. So it's been quite a, it's been quite a weird one. I think, I think we know that he's not what he used to be. And, and I think Portugal probably are better without him. Um, but I think that, I think he'll continue to start. And, will continue i i just think that it's probably a decision to be fair that should it's it's one of those that you either make before the world cup or, or before the euros or um because if you make it during it becomes such a statement that it can it can rattle rattle the team so it'll be interesting 
but I, I agree. I think they'll probably. I think Roberto Martinez is sticking by him. I don't think he has the guts to be mm. like just you sitting on the bench this weekend. Yeah, um, and yeah, look, never know. As I said, if there's one person you don't want to write off, it's probably him. But uh, we'll wait and see, won't we? I mean, keen, keen for the game, though. Um, keen to see what happens this weekend. And then we've got some semis next weekend. And then the final all coming, culminating on the 14th of July. Speaking of finals, um, there's been no cricket in the last week. So we have to move <laughs> very swiftly on. Um, oh, oh, oh. Are we going to address the elephant in the room? Oh, must we, Stevie? Must we? Must we? What? Yeah. Tell us. What's the elephant? Uh, well, the elephants actually, well, it depends on if you want to talk about the elephant in terms of the pros not winning a World Cup, or you can focus on the fact that we have officially played our first ever uh, World Cup final. And um, Yeah, it's true, actually. Let's start with the semi-final win. Let's start with yeah, the semi-final. No, look, I mean, it was, that was as, as, as easy and disciplined as you can. I mean, there's an Afghanistan side that beat Australia, um, you know, for example, and... Uh, not Australia was, as a result. Yeah, with, and when they, when they beat Bangladesh and they've been solid and everybody said they're saying there could be a bit of a, a banana peel and you went on and absolutely hammered them. So we then came up against India, who've also a little bit sort of a point to prove, really, in terms of they haven't won a, a, an international tournament, I think it was like 12 years or whatever it was before since they've won a, a, a tournament. And, um, you know, I and everyone was very quick to throw around sort of the, the chokers tag and stuff like that. Um, and I think, you know, the reason for that is because obviously the game was very much in our favor um, when, you know, needing 30 or 30. But having said that, when you need 30 or 30 with two O's from Jasper Boomer, it's not 30 or 30. Um, I think that is quite an important point to look at. And yes, you know, you, you sort of back any team in that situation. But I think what we saw is the greatest white ball bowler of all time being the greatest white ball bowler of all time. Should we have taken more risks against him? I think so. I think we had wickers in hand, and I think that we... You know, we probably could have afforded to have had to go and you catch an outside edge and the ball finds the boundary and everything becomes uh, a different a different story. Um, let's, yeah, Steve, let, let's quickly give a just a high level overview for just for for context before we like really dive into those last couple of overs because I, I imagine we're gonna, there's going to be a lot to speak about in that. Um, first of all, is just obviously you know India winning the toss, electing to bat. Um, getting off to a fly in those first couple of overs, right? It, it, it looked a little bit scary because we had seen Rohit Sharma go crazy in in his previous two games, scoring you know like I think it was both over over sixty runs at a strike rate of plus one fifty. Um, Keshav coming back with two wickets. Um, Virakoli playing such a Virakoli innings, going at just over a runner ball, no risks, nothing. That, in the that, air. that standard, so close to being a dreadful innings, actually. Yeah. Oh, you know? I, I was saying it. I was saying if Virakoli goes out, he is going to be crucified yeah. by the Indian fan base because this is just the innings that he came under so much scrutiny for at the IPL. And I must so admit, if if we had won, I would have had to go with him. If we had won, <laughs> when we were thirty for thirty, not, you know, I mean, not with the score that he did score now. No, not, not, so, not, well, not, to a certain degree. I mean, we know we mentioned when we said they're saying you know, uh, you know, one hundred and fifty is not like the minimum strike rate these days. I mean, to almost not battle the entire World innings. Cup, not at this World Cup, and not yeah, but that final. pitch was a two hundred pitch. If it wasn't, a, if it wasn't the same, it wasn't the final. I think it as a two hundred pitch. It was the know. highest. It was literally the highest T twenty score ever in a World Cup, and we Which almost is chased why it. Down. I'm saying I don't think you can come after the guy who then scored the most runs in what no, was you the but yeah, runs again they got yeah, but again they got over the line. Axel Patel, 47 or 31, 151 strike rate. Shivan Dubey, 27 or 60, 168 strike rate. But so, I, think, I think he laid the platform. Anyways. Look, ah, look, look, look. now we've got the anchor. The anchor back in T20, oh, hey? Well, we, we, <laughs> we, the team were 30. Um, they were three down for, for a couple of rounds. I mean, Axel Patel came in, got thrown in early, and as we were told, didn't know that that was going to happen until all of a sudden um, it was Surya Kumayara. Um, had gone out off the back of both Punt and Sharma's wicket. So he was thrown in early. And that was really uh, the massive innings that got them back on track, which then allowed Shubman Dube um, and, and Hardik Panya to try and like, kind of finish it off. Um, but Axel Patel, you can't you can't compliment him enough for his role mm. to play in this final. I mean, there, there I could think, have been... I think, that was the, I think that was the innings that won it. Absolutely. That broke all the momentum. Broke all the momentum. Would have put so much pressure... On you know they kept Dube, Pandya, Jadeja for the back because all they want to do is swing for the fences, but they yeah. couldn't when they were coming in, which would have been in the um, in the fourth over or in the fifth over. So 
he literally he anchored that innings along with Virat Kohli, set the platform for them to finally go after it. Um, Stevie, and then let's quickly get into um, our, or our bowling. I, and and this is for me actually where I think the game was lost because I think a couple of our bowlers went for far too many, and I have to come after. Um, Markram here unfortunately because I don't want to but I have to and in that we played two spinners and we haven't finished either of them both Keshav and Shamsi finishing on only three overs and not four and if you're picking two spinners it feels like you have to use them I mean Keshav was the the person who picked up the two wickets in the second over which brought it back on track um, and then it just felt like those middle overs where it was Kohli and Axar, they just weren't bold enough. And then it became too late for them to bowl because now it was the finishers who were on. And I kept with every over going past, I was like, it's too late for them to come back. It's too late for them to come back. So I feel like we left two spinning overs out there. Obviously, Mark and bowled two of those himself. So we did end up with eight spinning overs. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just look, you know, the likes of Janssen going for 49 runs, getting one wicket, but at 12 and over, I knew with him coming back, I think I just would have backed one of those spinners to have at least um, gone for a little bit less than him because he was much more expensive on the backside, was Janssen. And, and I think there was just at least one more spinning over, if not two more spinning overs in that bowling side. Yeah, I think you're probably about one short, I think. I don't think um, Marke Janssen should have had that fourth. Um, I think if we if we had laid it one more, um, got a spin, and I think you know he'd have had a bar and Nokia to finish. Unfortunately, this is now the, the second World Cup playoff game where Marco Jans has just not come together with, um, with the ball, and it's something he's going. I mean, look, he is so young, so he's got so much time to work on, but um, it is something he's going to have to try and really sort of face and and stand up because we all know the talent he's got, um, but he is someone now that we've seen that when he's under pressure struggles a little bit, which I mean it's difficult because you look at his performance in the semi final and how well he bowled against Afghanistan. But, yeah. um, you know, he conceded 49 runs at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's, I think it's more about the ability for a bowler to change the tide mid-game. Yeah. And we haven't actually seen that when, when, he, when it starts feeling like it's going one way, it kind of continues to, and whereas on the opposite way, versus Afghanistan, he was on top, you know, the, the entire time. So, um, but then getting into the batting, Stevie, we obviously... So in reply to 176, we purchase ended up on 169 for eight after our 20 overs. Reza scoring four or five, a bit of a disappointing um, tournament for him. But he, I mean, he got a Jaffa from Bumrah in the final. It's hard to, it, it just felt like the whole tournament he was playing around the ball and not trusting, mm. not trusting um, just to play through the line of it. I mean, so many small nickels or bolts. Um, from him not really being caught in the boundary much. Um, you know, he, he had a decent knock in the, in the semifinals, which was was a absolute rat trap of a pitch. And and you have to commend him for actually getting us over the line because I think if we had lost a couple of early ones there, it could have been actually very nerve wracking. But uh, he went out early. Quinny played a really solid innings. I was I started getting worried when I saw Quinny playing within himself he started knocking around ones and twos and i was like quinny this isn't you and you could see how much it meant to him like now being yeah. in a final and I, it's uh, it's so funny because i love it when i see quinny care it's yeah like, even when he got that insane run out versus axel patel which, he which didn't by the way mention. i think still it could go down as one of the most ludicrous moments i've ever seen in a world cup final the way i've watched it so many times in the way he hides taking off his glove and shifting the ball into his right hand to make it that Axel Patel relaxed and didn't and was just ball, but he was ball watching. Axel I mean, was ball watching. But he almost like looked at Quinton and was like, "I dare you!" And like, I dare you to have a go. And he like, just held it back here, slipped off the glove. Axel Patel wouldn't have even known that he didn't. That he didn't have his glove on, and he just whipped in a rocket into the non-striker's end. Um, and and I thought that was, I mean, that was a game-changing moment because they could have gone on and got another an, an extra ten or fifteen had Axel stayed in there. Um, but when I saw Quinny batting and caring a little bit, it's, it makes me it makes me so happy on the inside, bro. Because you know yeah. what I mean. He doesn't care about anything except fishing that oak. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh yeah, he is a professional cricketer, and he does yeah, want to win. He does actually want to win the World Cup. Yeah. yeah, and 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 he does uh, care a lot. So that, yeah, that was I think that was the, thing. the weirdest anything. thing for me has been the criticism towards Tristan Stubbs, which I've seen a lot of. Which 
Like I yeah. couldn't understand. I knew what the standard is. We've got to change our, our adjust our mindsets as cricketers because everyone's criticizing because of the way he went out, not the fact that batting the way he was and taking those risks and playing those unorthodox shots got him to 31 or 21, playing counter-attacking blows, getting yeah. us back into the game and ahead of the game to certain degree. He's, um, a, he's a busy player. He's never going he to stay. That's, um, he's yeah. not going to stay flat on his feet. I mean, I, my my synopsis of how he went down is that he, he literally what he planned, he wanted the ball to be bowled there. He moved across the stumps to yeah, get the ball it. on his leg side and he missed a straight one. Like, yeah. that's it's a not, It's not that hectic. He had done everything think, right. He had moved right. I think right it's very right. disappointing. I think he would be the first to say that he should have hit that. Yeah. I think it's a decent ball. By Axel I don't think it was, I don't think it was incredible. Like, but, you know, one of those, you put it on the stumps, kind of yorked him a little bit. Um, but he should have put it away in the same breath. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think the main thing is the fact that if you look at a 31 of 21, you know, as, as you mentioned, you said they say, oh, you know, Reza Hemsworth got a Jaffa, so, you know, it was unlucky four or five. And you look at uh, Tristan Saps, 31 of 21, you know, strike rate of close to 150. People are like, oh, but look how he went out, he threw his wicket. And I'm like, no, he didn't throw his wicket. He made a mistake. But this whole idea of as soon as you go out because you're playing something that's not orthodox, you know, I mean, yeah. which is worse? You don't, going out play, trying... you don't have to play a forward defensive to, to be allowed to go out. Exactly, you know, um, and you can't you can't praise these guys when when you know Hunter Clarkson's you know smacking sixes over a cover which with, with zero foot me, foot movement which is not taught in the cricket manual or yeah. reversing stuff like it and be like oh this guy's so good and then when he tries and goes out you're like oh he's so irresponsible and I think we do yeah. that far too often as cricket fans so I really want to adjust that mindset I was frustrated he went out but not at the fashion he went out that's just the way he bats um, and yeah. if, and if you want to start if you want to start saying telling him not to do that. You're gonna you're gonna completely lock him back up to what he was. Yeah, no, absolutely. But then, obviously, we also saw Adam Markram nick off uh, another disappointing tournament for him with the bat. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as well. Thank goodness he. I mean, uh, great captaining throughout the tournament for me, the captain of the tournament. Um, and then it was down to um, Clarkson and Miller, and you know the big story is is when Clarkson you know got hold of um, it was um, Patel. And all, all the spinners uh, between Patel, Kudibyava, and R Jadeja managing to get us to, we needing 30 or 30, right? And at this stage, we are four down, 30 from 30. You know, win percentage, I, I believe, was at 96%. You know, unbelievable. And the big question is, Stevie, did we choke? No, I don't think you can say we choked. Um, you know, you can't. It's too easy of a word to throw around every single time you lose. And I know people are sort of saying because of where we were, but again, you know, Jasper Boomer finished with the best economy ever in a world, it's a T20 World Cup, by the way. Uh, and it wasn't a long, it wasn't a particularly short T20 World Cup. So I think at the end of the day, you know, the game was lost when we lost Klaassen, the way he was playing. Um, you know, I mean, Boomer finished with the economy of 4.5 and Ashley, Ashley Singh with the economy of 5. So, you know, at the end of the day, we, we saw a masterclass in that. I, I do think that, again, I would like to have seen us take a bit more um, risk against Boomer. I mean, I understand how good he is, but I just think we had sort of nothing yeah. to lose. And by saying, oh, right, cool, we'll just concede and over, you went from a runner ball factor and to all no, of a sudden I mean, now needing... Something's you know, gone horribly wrong between needing 30 or 30 to needing 16 off the last over. Yeah, you know, I'm the, saying you, it's, it's, you've four, had 24, 24 balls and you scored, what, 14 runs. You know, and for I me, think that that was mm. the issue. But also, I mean, it's such fine margins. I mean, you look at the catch, you know, by Suri Kumiyadov on, on Dave Miller and the whole controversy about where the boundary was and, you know, should it have been uh, a six and stuff like that. I don't think it's, I mean, I'm not going to comment on it because I think it's a bit trivial, but I do wonder if it was the other way around what the um, reaction would have been. I think if it was the other way around, it would have been blown up yeah. much bigger than what it was. But, yeah, I mean, I, it's one of those. I've been waiting for that something like that to happen. I've always found it frustrating when, like, you know, a fielder will dive over the fence, knock the ball back in, and move move the boundary rope. You know, like yeah. a, a meter, two meters, meters back is, yeah, and, and it never gets like fixed back into place. And it's like you know the squiggly thing, but it's all it's like a, this commonly accepted thing in cricket. And it's not, you know, it's not match fixing. No one's intended to do that. But at the end of the day, the boundary rope was an extra thirty centimeters. Um, it back. was an extra centimeter. That's how close it was. Yeah, it, it all and, had to be. I mean, you look at how close. I also thought I it was think wild it's the most how quickly I've ever seen in a World oh, yeah. Cup final. But it was. Like, I, I, was I think I found unbelievable how quickly the 
the third umpire had a look and was like, I mean, two frames, cool, we're done. I was like, yeah. I mean, you look at how some things are absolutely scrutinized. Um, it was a very, I very quick right decision. Call, well. I think it was the right call. Well, um, he didn't hit, again, the, 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 in terms of if you asked him, did he touch the boundary rope? I don't think he did. The main argument that a lot of people have is, you know, the boundary rope shouldn't have been there. And if you look at the right. white line, which is supposed to be the reference, which is supposed to be inverted commas, if you learn the, the laws of the game, is supposed to act as the boundary. But again, as you said, it's one of those things which in practice is never really the case. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think had he called that out as a result of that, it would have been far more controversial because then yeah, you listen, say, well, as a third umpire, by the way, you're not making that had call. He known that, had he known that, he could have still taken the catch. He just, he just played within the boundary that he knew was there. So had he known that the line was a little bit earlier, he might have still taken that catch. And judging by the fact that he took the other one, he very easily could have taken it, even had he had yeah. like 30 less centimeters. So, uh, I mean, a real moment of, of brilliance. But to bring it back to needing 30 or 30, and then, you know, 16 off the last, I think the big thing that hasn't been spoken about is how we've gone into this tournament with, and South Africa in general have had this for the last couple of years, a shallow batting lineup. We do not bat deep. We have our top six, and then we hope that, you know, Mark Janssen, being a bowling all-rounder, comes off every now and again. He aver he doesn't average more than 15 with the bat in T20s. Yeah, I think we saw, his, we saw his SA20 and thought, oh, cool, he can, he's, 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 he's got it, he can bat. He can uh, hold a bat, and he can come off every now and again, but he's not he's not a someone you would classify as, you wouldn't classify him as a batsman, he's a bowling, bowling all-rounder. And then yeah. you could probably say the same, um, for Keshav, he'll go no. out swinging and he'll, he'll uh, no, go... I'm sorry, he doesn't go out swinging. I'm sorry, uh, this is my one big gripe. How does Keshav Maharaj continue to bat ahead of Chris Robata in the T20 format? I, yeah, I, 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 think, I think he's got to probably just get ball and bat, I feel like, more frequently. But may, may, maybe it's not actually the case in the T20 format. But I think if you... But then if you're looking at Keshav and Robata, they are like for like in terms of they can you know get it away every now and again but you know neither of which you want to ever depend on and where i think the game was won and lost was when we lost Clarsen. was that miller wasn't able to get on strike i believe he only yeah. faced i think eight balls then in those final overs so Keshav wasn't able to get him on strike so the what happened between the 30 from 30 to then you know the needing 16 off the last it's because um Miller couldn't get on strike. And when he was on strike, he was facing, he was either facing very good death bowling, in which case he couldn't um, get the ball away. And he just didn't face enough balls to wait for the bad ball to then put India under pressure again. So ever since Carlson went out, it was just unrelenting pressure on the South Africans and pretty much just on Miller's head because no yeah. one else was going to really chase that down except him. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the fact that all those wasted balls, you know, four off 11 is what Mark Janssen and Kevin Maharaj finished with if you combine those two. And that, that, that is, I mean, that's, if you look at the context of the game, that was where we lost it. I mean, that is, I think there were, of, the, of those 11, I think, I think one of them was a two as well. So I think, I think it was like nine dot balls um, or eight dot balls between those two in the final, like 20 balls, basically. Um, and if those were all, if half of those are singles, we win the game. You know, um, and yeah. I think that's 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 a massive my part. My point is also that you can't. You also, for at least for um, Keshav, it's hard to to blame him. You know, you don't want to blame him as as because he's not a batsman, and that's what I'm saying is that we do bat shallow. So everyone's saying we're four, we're only four down, needing thirty of thirty. We're also only one wicket away from us getting into the tail. Which is essentially what happened. Marco, yeah, I think, I think the biggest uh, issue is you look at that Indian batting lineup, um, and there are people who, who can hold a bat. For example, um, you know you had Jadeja coming in at what eight, um, yeah. compared to 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 us, where you know you've got what Akesha coming in at eight. Yeah. Um, so and Marco Janssen, and I mean jadeja has got test centuries and is, is a. I mean, sometimes can even almost play as a batsman with some of the form he's had. Yeah. And we've got Marco Janssen coming in at seven. He bats, I think he backed four in the IPL. Like, yeah, so, you know, so that's that's kind of the difference in quality there. So I think at the, at the end of the day, we need either a... I think our problem is we've got two spinners that don't bat, really. 
Um, and we don't have any, and the only team we can kind of hold a bat is Marco Janssen, who just didn't come off this tournament at all with the bat. So you, there is no genuine all rounder in that side who could ever play as just a batsman, for example. Um, which I think a lot of a lot of teams around um, the circuit have, um, like a Moeen Ali, yeah. for example. And you we know, spoke who about could, who could, I mean, Ali, something like friends. he was the he was their all rounder. He yeah. got promoted to to five. You know, in the in the fourth over of the match, um, and was able to you know score fifty. You know yeah. that, that that's something that the that the poachers don't have is someone. And that's who's why able. that's why Tobias Shams has never gotten a not not gotten a sniff of an of an IPL contract, for example. Even I think Maharaj taken so long to get an IPL contract is that in the IPL you have to be able to bat, or you have to be bowling absolute wheels. You know, you uh, look at the bowlers. I, mean, I, I don't believe you have to bat down to eleven for for IPL. No. Being... Down but to eight. you have to be you have to be able to do the more than let me rephrase it. You have to be able to do more than just bowl. You know, for example, from an IPL perspective, they look at the value of Tobias Champs. They're looking at four overs of leg spin, which is unreal. I mean, he's been the T Twenty number one in the world, but he's a liability in the field, and he doesn't bat. So you look at the IPL now, and you look at how everybody is contributing across every. I mean, as you mentioned, Axel Patel. Look at some of the catches he's taken throughout the tournament, for example, and the fielding he's brought in. Jadeja, for example. I mean, Jadeja okay. came in what, at eight and bowled two mm. overs, one over, best yeah. fielder in the world, arguably. You know, And yeah. so it's, it's, cricket's become so much more. And I will say fielding comes into it because we're now seeing, I mean, that catch from Surya Kuryadov was not happening 10 years ago. This whole uh, concept of throwing balls back over the boundary and stuff like that, that has only come out in the last 10, 10, in the last 10 years where, where fields now have the ability to be able to do that kind of thing. And I think that's, for me, what I love so much about where the game's going is take away the power hitting, which I think is not great for the game. The athleticism we are seeing in, these, in, these, in some of these players, the shots, the type of shots we're seeing, for example, the, the fielding is mental. The catches that people are taking, even the ground fielding, the, the awareness that they have is, is a whole different level. But I think moving forward, that's going to become a big part of any young player coming through. You've got to be an all-round asset. Not yeah. to say that you have to be a number four batsman all the time, but you can't be a a bowler I'm who's not you know in the top the, two best bowlers in the team and not be able to hold a bat and be a bit of a liability in the field because you know you there's, there becomes more shortfalls than than the value you add because if you have one bad day with the ball you are bringing nothing to that team. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and you know, just to uh, move on to kind of look at the future. You know, Protea is now going to be hosting a ODI World Cup in 2027. Um, contrary to some reports, we've it's announced that David Miller will not be retiring. Um, and you've got to feel for him. That photo of him, um, you know, on the brink of tears at the end of the game was really, really tough. Dude, for me, it was for me, it was when he was crying watching the review. Yeah. Oh, and you could just see, like, it already started. And he was the one, I, mean, I think I mentioned last, he was the one person I wanted us to win the World Cup for. Yeah, it's Miller time is eternal and oh it just felt like he was gonna do it you just you saw it written on the wall but not to be stevie not to be we go again though we go again we do go again we, we, we got further than we ever have been first final mm -hmm. and as as I, i'm in your court i don't i don't think we choked i think if if anything we let ourselves down i think with ball in hand not with bat in hand because had you mentioned this is the highest ever score in a in a um, T Twenty World Cup final, and we yeah. almost probably chased that. You know, yeah. that's, so it would have been a strike if we had. Exactly. Um, so, but moving on to that ODI World Cup. So, I mean, it's, I guess it's a, a similar position that we spoke about for the Springboks, in that you know who is actually going to make it. You're looking at some of these players. Shambo is going to be 37. Miller 38. Clausen 37. Reza 37. You know, Temba. Um, 37 you know so some oldies there but then also um the likes of a could see um hmm. you know brietzka who's been in and around it and andre berger um they all you know kind of around between the 31 and 28 age tristan Stubbs is only going to be 26 which is ludicrous by the time they walk yeah, and, only 27. And to be fair, so in three years time in club peter's going to be the best yeah <laughs> spinner in the world so it'll only be like probably 20 i think 24 at the time so he's going to be He's going to be huge. It will actually be awesome to see him learn off of the likes of Shambo and Kesha because it's actually just been really them who we've seen our spinners in the last what feels like ten years, really. Um, well, I'm very interested to see what our champions trophy team uh, side will look like next year. You know, in Pakistan, yeah. 
conditions where, where Spinner is is vital. I'd be very interested to see. I don't think we'll take a Reza Hendricks, for example. Um I look look here at this stage is only playing T twenties for the for the four for SA whether he'll you know, scale that back and, and, and start playing one day as again, for example, whether he'll try and put himself up for the Champions Trophy to try and get him into contention. I mean, he'll only be 33 at the next World Cup, so I imagine he will. Uh, I don't see why he wouldn't want to play at a home World Cup, um, and he'll certainly be young enough to do it. Rabada will be young enough. Yeah. Um, Marco Jans will be young enough. So our, our, our seamers don't really change. Um, you know, it, it's up to Gerald Casillo to try and displace them. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's it's the batsmen really that, that 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 become the issue. Not that any of them are that old, but they're going to be in that mm, yeah. sort of of way. And I mean, are we going to see a Breva step up, for example, um, as you mentioned, yeah. Matthew Breska? There um, are players that we need to, to and Ryan Rickleton, for example. So there are there are. Yeah. I mean, I think we've got we could probably predict a relatively close squad for for twenty twenty seven with a lot of the players who are in and around the group at the moment. Because yeah. as far as I'm concerned, give Rob Walters the key. Yeah, I mean, an yeah, unlikely yeah, World Cup yeah, semi final, yeah, which we all didn't back us, and then was four rounds away from winning a T20 World Cup, and he's been in the job for less than two years. Yeah. Neither of which were, if you think of chokes, you think, you know, unbelievably bad, you know, losses, and neither of our, the semi final versus Australia was was a choke, and I, and I don't think this one was, although this one did come, we did come a lot closer. Stevie, let's move on to Wimbledon. As mentioned, I managed to get so, to the um, to the grounds um, yesterday. No, two days ago, Monday morning um, or Monday evening, rather. Unfortunately, I missed Lloyd Harris. Yeah, I was being, about to say, dude, if you're gonna go, you gotta go watch the, the South Africans. You yeah, I, I do have a full time job, unfortunately, so I only could sneak out afterwards. But I mean, he got play of um, play of the day or shot of the day um, because of point of the day. Um, really, it was just point phenomenal. Of the day. For I mean, he came back from behind after losing his first two sets, six three, six four. Went on to win the final three sets, um, seven um, seven six with an entire break, winning that tie break seven five, six in the fourth set, winning six two, and then seven six again, tie break eleven um, points to nine um, in 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 that tie break game. I mean, he's he's had to go through three rounds of qualifying to just get to Wimbledon. He's got a ranking of one hundred and eighteen. So I mean. By all means, let's go all the way. Um, obviously, backing him, we haven't really got any other um, South Africans in and around um, the circuit. Our next best male is Chris Van Veek in 387th, uh, with a 387th board ranking. Um, but just a bit of history, Stevie, and there's been no, um, never mind South African, but African player to actually have ever won a singles Titan title in the Open era. Um, we have had a couple finalists, though. Um, yeah, first Kim Anderson. Um, well, was, yeah, we'll get there, one, first yeah. we're going to take it back to 1921, Brian Ivan. Uh, yeah, Pop- I remember that one well. <laughs> and then we got had the female in, in 1960, Sandra Reynolds, um, losing to Brazilian Maria Bueno. Then we had Kevin Curran, who lost to a 17-year-old Boris Becker in 1985. That's poor form, really. <laughs> how dare he? Yeah, um, losing to a 17-year-old. And, but he did... He did win the mixed doubles with Anne Smith from USA in 1982. So we do have a Wimbledon champion, just not in the singles. And then obviously Kevin Anderson in 2018, who lost 3 0 in sets to Djokovic after that um, semi final. He was a bit tired, to be fair. Yeah. I mean, he his 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 3 2 win versus Isner, um, the final set was 26 24 and kind of was games. one of the Mate. last um, kind of straws. Um, to them actually going on and changing the rule to max of, um, I believe it's 10 games in a, in a fifth set. Um, and then it's won by two from there. So, you know, he, he did, he did change the, the, the game of tennis as it were, just unfortunately yeah. not with a winner's medal at Wimbledon, but Lloyd Harris, go do your thing. Keep it up. We are watching. Um, and he's, on, can't he's, wait. he's playing today actually. So by the time he, people are hearing this, he might be playing as we speak, actually. I guess, well, then uh, you can assume he's going to be in the show yeah, so nice. Yeah, looking forward to that. But we all know that uh, Carlos, unless Lloyd Harris does the does does it, we all know that Carlos Alcaraz is winning the Wimbledon. So nothing to worry about there. <laughs> unless um, unless Lloyd Harris does Lloyd Harris. Yeah, it's going to be a Harris Alcaraz final, and and Lux for Alcaraz. You know, it's been real for you, but uh, we're coming. We're look. taking over. Um, awesome, Stevie. And quickly, let's touch on the Olympics before we get into the predictions. 
Um, we're just going to touch on a couple of the exciting athletes that we have coming through, and we'll be touching on a couple of different ones as we, in the lead up to the Olympics soon. Um, we're going to start off with our 400 meter runners. Obviously, the big name in Wade Funny Kak, he is back and he's running close to, close to his bed. Um, no, he's not back. He's not close to his bed. He's just there. Just there. He's just running. There. He's, he's been in a couple um, 200 meter races, a couple 400 meter races, posting 45 um, minute times. But the exciting thing is, Stevie, is that we actually have three 400 meter runners um, who are all running sub 45s in um, Light Pele, um, Zakiti, um, Nene, and Wade Finikak, um, who are all there. So we, we are looking to qualify for the four by um, 400 meter relay. And, you know, by the looks of it, we have every chance of, of doing really well there. So that that is very exciting. Um, if it's not just for watching, being able to watch Wade again on the big circuit, he's currently ranked fourth in the world for um, whatever that um, kind of means. It kind of can go out the window when it comes to this. Yeah, I mean, it means nothing really in the Olympics. Time, just, especially, especially, like, especially, it means nothing in the Olympic year because these athletes are also so very like so cautious of showing their hand in inverted commas. They're very selective about the races that they run. They, they don't they don't want to run themselves. I mean, you've got to try and get enough races to be fast enough, but you don't want to. You know, fatigue is a thing. You want to be as fresh as possible. So it's always a very interesting, you, you know, going into Olympic year because you monitor the, you know, the your your top athletes, but often they're not the the world leaders going into into these events. Um, you know, Usain Bolt wasn't always, you know, walking into the, you know the the Olympics with you know the you know three out of the four fastest times of the year. Yeah, but. You know, he'd walk in and you're going, well, that's that's the one to beat. So, yeah, I, I don't look at uh, world rankings too much. I mean, you got to look at season form to a certain degree. Um, but it's it's especially when you're talking about things like the 100 meters, which is so volatile. That one good start and Sabini could be a champion. You know, we are talking about something which takes place in less than 10 seconds. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and he has posted a sub-10 time running uh, 994 in Oslo. Um, in May and winning winning that meet, beating out the um, current Olympic champion. At the end of the day, the box have won two World Cups in that stadium. Surely we're winning a medal in it. <laughs> yeah. Surely. No, a couple in the track and field at least. Um, like but have to be winning a medal there. For sure. For sure. So, I mean, Kani Simbide, it feels like he's been in and around the finals now and we were used to be happy now he's getting into finals. No, now, medal. I, I think there's, there, there's, a, there's a medal on the horizon for him. There has to be. Um, so, so fingers crossed, but CB, we're going to get into a couple more of the, of the team sports. We'll get into, um, you know, the hockey, the rowing, um, the, you know, even the badminton, for example. Yeah, we've um, got some surfers. We've got a very interesting team. We've got a, we've got a couple of skateboarders. I went to school with one we were talking a little bit about, um, but before we go, I just want to talk about, you know, do we dare to dream about another 800 meter medal in the women's event with our new I don't want to call it a sensation. So let's, 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 let's taper the expectations. But um, Prudence uh, Sekodise has got a world leading time of the year so far with the personal best that she's been bringing down slowly but steadily over the last few uh, few years and won her first Diamond League title in May. Um, so, you yeah, know, no, she very no, much no, has no, played down no, the Costa Mina. Yeah. Uh, you know, comparisons, obviously, who will not be competing. We have been robbed of many goals um, due to her ban. But um, so, yeah, that is the, the big the big news from a, from athletics, a women's athletics point of view um, is that, uh, and she's 22 years old, so it'll, it'll be her first Olympics. But, um, you know, I would like to see, and, and, and she's had a very unfortunate time, time in the last year at the World Championships uh, where she collided in the semi-final um and uh with the defending champion actually by the way and um they tried to file an application to get her into the final which was the ninth so she didn't get to run in the final last year which is frustrating because it's so important to have that experience of um of, of running in a final but maiden a debut a debut olympics for her very keen to see what she can do um even if it's just for the experience being 22 years old means that she'll be able to come back in four years time at 26 and be basically in her her prime um, so yeah, I think she's very much the one to watch out. The other one, which is very interesting, is to see what Curtis Stain does. A lot of people are criticizing I'll her for doing the comrades. Line. I'll be there for the last weekend. I'll be flying that South African flag high. So if anything, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give her an extra extra boost of support. Maybe she'll be in first position. Yeah, you can watch her just fly by. No so, yeah, I mean, I don't think we, we we don't think we really ever really put a lot of pressure on our on our marathon runners. To be fair, um, there's just far too many. The quality so, is yeah. is phenomenal. 
Um, but very, very keen to see how she does go because she is, not to say qu confident, um, but she is a, a quite an unexpected, um, you, you know, she's she's been so dominant in, in the longer format, stuff like that. The last calendar year, she has run a personal best and a South African record um, for the marathon. So who knows where, and she's been continually bringing her times down everywhere else. So who knows um, what, what will happen with her but um yeah she's probably our best option if, i mean if she puts in the race of her life she's probably our only real um long distance long distance medal hope yeah. um that we've yeah. got across that marathon steve mccorker and uh Alric Holland are legends but they're not they're not threatening that two hour bar I mean, barrier to 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 yeah. win to win an olympic gold unfortunately it is very very competitive stevie let's jump into the predictions of this week and no better place to start than Springboks versus Ireland. Have you got a score in mind? I do indeed. Okay. Uh, you're wanting to count us in? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Box, box by 12. Oh, wow. Wow. Significant. Sheepers. Okay. Box by 12 for Stevie. Box by three for me. Um, do you think it's going to be high scoring? Um, I think it's something like either way. I think we're going to win like 12 0 or we're going to win like 36 24. 12 0. That would be the most best match score ever. Four, four penalties from Andre Pollard. Stevie, if you get 12 0 right, I'll give you the, the, the predictions game. Yeah, it's all yours. Just you'll rock uh, up next week in, a, in, a, in, a, in an island jersey. Yeah, yeah. Literally, literally. Um, okay, cool. Well, let's let's keep it um, on the rugby format and this um, Australia versus Wales. Um, yeah, so I, was, I mean, I'm in between. Do we go New Zealand versus England, which I think is going to be quite one-sided, but I think Australia versus Wales is going to be very, very interesting because we've got no idea what to expect from either side. Um, it is the Joe Schmidt era, so I expect the Wallabies to get better. Mm. Um, I was very impressed with what I saw from Wales against us a couple of weeks ago, but they've also the wooden spoon winners. So I've got no idea what to expect from either of these sides. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's always like these Southern, Southern hemisphere teams. It takes them so long or us all so long to, to play again after, after a world cup. So whereas, you know, Wales are now eight on the um, yeah. eight losses on the bounce. So we, 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 we've seen a lot of what they don't want to replicate. Um, and so, with that in mind, what is your, or let's get the, the prediction out the way. I'm going to count us in CV. Three, two, one. Australia, Australia by, by 10. Okay, mm. pretty close. Pretty I think close. Wales will be a lot better next season, next, next week than they will be this week. Um, and I think that the Australia, I, I'm almost expecting to start quite well. I think Joe Schmidt's a very astute coach, and I think that they've got a lot to prove. Um, what everyone's saying. Mm, yeah. Mr. Attention to detail. Yeah. So I think that they'll they'll be very solid against I think they're also against they play against the poor Wales side. So I think that they will get a win. But I wouldn't be surprised if Wales do put in a hell of a performance next to weekend and come up just short. I do think mm -hmm. they will be competitive, but I do think this Australian side will respond relatively well to, to the Joe Schmidt era. Mm -hmm. I, I I hope they come out of it strong because we need a strong Australia um I, also wanna, I, wanna, I want a good British and Irish Lions series next year because at the moment the British and Irish Lions are going to go there and put 40 on them in all three tests. Yeah. And that's cuck. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. No, no, no one wins. Um, yeah. Well, British but... and Irish Lions do, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, us, the fans, the fans. So. Yes. Um, even the last one, Spain versus Germany. Um, let's get into that. Obviously, the two possible favorites or the most informed teams for sure at this Euros. Have you got a score in mind? Yeah, I've been flip flopping on this the entire show. Um, I do, I do. I'm ready when you are. Okay, three, two, one, two, one, two, Spain. Two, Germany. Germany and pens. Huge, huge. Spain, um, I'm yeah. very excited. I'm, I'm excited for the Musiala versus Yamal. You know, yeah. the, uh, oh, it's so good. And it's also, so, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's the two teams that are tactically the best. Um, Nagelsmann's got that German side playing very German football. Um, but I don't think that they've been as good as they potentially could be. I think that that first game um, did kind of inf overinflate their stocks a little bit. Mm. Um, they have struggled a little bit at times. Um, Spain have been have been very good. Nico Williams, oh, 
so cool to watch. So good, so good, so quick. And Just the, the, the wingers on display. Um, yeah. I mean, take the pace of Yamal, Nico Williams, um, Musiala, and then Leroy Sane. I mean, yeah. and I know everyone's like all on the Yamal train because he's so and, young, and he is. But I've just I've really enjoyed watching Nico Williams. I think he's, he's so so cool to watch. 16. Like oh, that's such a joke. What was I doing? At and, it, and wouldn't it be so standard for like Luis de la Fuente? You know, not a manager who anybody knows. I, mean, I was yeah, watching a podcast yeah. the other day and they were talking about, you know, the fact that Southgate might not be the only issue in England, the fact that England don't have technical players and everyone was like, how can you say that? He's like, well, because they're not as good as the Spanish players. Like, how can you say that? He was like, well, you probably can't even tell me who the Spanish manager is, but look what he's doing with him. And they were like, um, yeah, we don't actually know who it is. So it'd be, it'd be so like typical of just like Spanish talent. I think the Spanish era is back, dude. They're back. Yeah, yeah they could be. They could be because they, they, they've, been the, they've been the sleeping giant for a while. So and happy to have them back because jeepers when they play it's beautiful to watch. Yeah. Um, Stevie, thank you for the show. A big, a very long one, but a, a great one nonetheless. Jam packed. There's so much going on. Transition time means that there's lots going on, um, but we'll continue to be bringing you a lot of um, Olympic build up and follow through um, on Wimbledon, and of course there will be the massive Springbok game this weekend. Fortunately, there won't be um, any more protest talk for the next little while. Um, but um, can we talk about the shambles? By the way, there's an official pro tiers welcome back thing today. Those the being Lungin Gidi, it... Kesha Maharaj, I think to Barry Shams. I think that's it. Oh. Well, I hope they have a nice scrambling <laughs> tea. Yeah, uh, I mean, I wonder if somebody's told the catering department. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the buffet for them. They probably just want to go home. Shame. Yeah, anyway. I mean, you're looking at Gidi. You sat on the bench. You haven't played a minute the entire thing. And now you, now, you, now, you, now you need to come home and shape the media and why you guys lost. He's like, I didn't even play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What did I do? Yeah, I was at the netball, Alex. Yeah. No. Anyways, um, Stevie, thank you for the show. Um, yeah, and pleasure. thank you for the listeners for watching. If you made it all this way, please do um, slap a like on the video. It really does um, help um spread the word and if not please share it with someone who you think will like the show as well stevie until next week we'll know who has won the first game um between south africa and ireland i hope your yep. prediction of 12 0 is absolutely bang on yeah well you know it's loftus for Forge is loftus uh, the highest one percentage of all stadiums um the real prediction is where the Rassi, <laughs> the Rassi saw or zombie will get played over the speaker. Over the, over the speakers, one yeah. of our predictions. I reckon that'll be part of the betting markers. You know, I reckon like <laughs> yeah, Betway's yeah. probably got like a, a little a little live tracker there on what's going to happen with that. Yeah. And right. will we see lights and like will we see something weird from Rassi this weekend? Yeah. Like lights or somebody on the side or something along those lines. There will be. We just don't know what it is. Correct. We'll find Thank out. You, Stevie. We'll chat to you next week, everyone. Have a good week and chat soon.